of the married couple who went to a very fine restaurant. While at the very fine restaurant, the woman sitting at the table looked across the room and she saw a man who was terribly intoxicated, stumbling all around, making a fool of himself, and she could not get her eyes off of him. She was very upset. Finally, her husband said, as she glared at this man, her husband said, what is so bothersome to you? Just leave him be. And the woman said, that's my ex-husband. And he's been drinking like that since the day I divorced him seven years ago. And the husband said, that's remarkable. You wouldn't think someone would be able to celebrate for that long. <laughs> oh, man. Most of the time it's hilarious because it's true. Got a one-sentence sermon for you today. By the way, thank you, Olivia, for helping us on our media. J.J. Banks on our sound. Nate Bittinger on our camera. We got a one-sentence sermon for you today. Thank you, comma, Jesus, exclamation point. Thank you, comma, pause, Jesus, exclamation point. I called somebody last year on the telephone and I was, they gave me their voicemail message. Hi, this is blah, blah, blah. I saw it was you that was calling, so I didn't answer. So I left them a uh, message and I said, hey, this is Tom Golden, period. Uh, how are you doing today, comma? I hope you're doing well, period. I talked like that for two paragraphs on a voicemail. My wife starts laughing in the middle. I'm trying to concentrate. It's a pretty serious call, I thought, trying to help somebody out in their life. And the whole time I'm this and that, comma, da, 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 exclamation point, da, 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 period. I got so used to talk to text, that's how I leave voicemails now. And that's how I think. And I can see now. Thank you, Jesus. Take a break, comma. Thank you, Jesus. Exclamation point. So, in the last couple few weeks, I've been thinking about this Sunday. And, uh, well, preparing other messages and this and that and the other. And I'm normally working on two, three messages at a time. So I get out the Bible, is normally what I do. And I start flipping pages and thinking to myself... I know for a fact whoever shows up on the, th on the Sunday before Thanksgiving is already going to be beat up and tired just thinking about Thanksgiving. My wife told me we're going to somebody's home. I said, great, as long as they're not coming to my home. It's stressful enough. She said, our job is to do two turkeys and take it to them. And I said, no, 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 no. Call somebody else that doesn't expect so much. The season is stressful enough. So I've been getting to think about what in the world, what story do we want to tell? What, what from the Bible could I share with you all that today would energize you, want to make you to become more powerful in the Holy Spirit, that would make you even maybe as simple as put a smile on your face. So I go to the Bible, trying to find something divine. Start flipping pages. Yeah. Nothing's really doing it. All this Bible stuff. So anyways, I... My brain or the Holy Spirit, I don't know what, and I guess it doesn't matter. It got me to this story here, Luke chapter 17. I'm reading, and the Bible says, Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy, they met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus 
Master, have pity on us. I was almost bored reading this, thinking, how oh, this is... When he saw them, he said, go, show yourselves to the priests. And as he went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, he came back and unwrapped his candy wrapper and then began to praise God. And in sort of a loud voice, he threw himself at Jesus' feet and he thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, were not all cleansed? And then Jesus said, where's the other nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Then Jesus said to him, rise and go, and your faith has made you well. And that's pretty much how we read the Bible. And then we put it down, and we try to go about the rest of our day, and we put a little time into the Bible and feel a little bit better about that, but rarely is the occasion when the words of the Bible jump up off the page and into our heart and into our mind. Because we're so preoccupied with a million other things. It's Thanksgiving week, we've got Christmas coming, then the New Year, then this and that and the other. And this afternoon I got my, somebody's coming over to my house and this is going on, that's going on. And Did you hear what they said about me last week anyways? Darn it. And life is just, it is what it is and it's in our face. And so then when we get to the Bible, we read stories and we're like, that's nice, but does that apply to me? Yes, it applies to you if you reach out. And want it. Here's the story. Jesus is traveling south out of Galilee. It's the last time that he will have ever preached in Galilee. As he's walking south, he's got to be thinking in his mind, I hope in my Father's great name, I hope that I said every word just right. I hope that I preached every sermon just right. I hope I healed everybody I could. I hope that when I was talking, people saw the spiritual authority in me. I hope these things for these people, my people. You see, Jesus was born and raised in Galilee. You know this. He made his home out of Capernaum. He was born in Nazareth, but then moved to Capernaum. Now he's coming back south. And as he's walking, the Bible says, he's walking in between Samaria and Galilee. He's got a thousand things on his mind. It's been three and a half years of hardcore ministry. Apathetic people, unbelieving people. The Jews don't believe him. They're satisfied with who they think he is or who they think he's not. Some of Jesus' closest followers did not even believe that he was the Christ. They got kind of used to Jesus. Some of them were following him just to see the show. But some of them were following him because they wanted him to turn around and touch them. Now Jesus is walking thousand things going through his brain. He comes up on this village. The Bible doesn't even call the village by name. It's a nowhere place. It's a nothing town. Outside the town, there are ten lepers. They had a death sentence on them. When you were diagnosed with leprosy in those days, and even these days, it's a death sentence on you. I told you last week, if you were a leper... And you had to come into town for anything at all whatsoever. You had to wear a mask on your face and stay six feet apart from everybody else. You all thought that was funny. The first service thought it was really funny. And I thought, I guess I'm going to say that again. Everybody thinks that's hilarious. But the fact is, when you go back to the book of Leviticus, that was the rule. Not only was that the rule, the other rule was when you lived outside of town. Because these lepers, here's the story, they got pulled, jerked, they got they got manhandled away from their family out of town and they got put in these death communities 
And these ten lepers were outside of town. And another rule they had was you had to stay 60 to 80 paces away from anybody else that got close to you. You had to ring a bell. You had to shout in a loud voice, unclean, 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 leprous, leprous, leprous. You had to say that to your own family. You talk about alone, afraid, depressed, anxiety, stressed out beyond max, wanting ready to commit suicide. You'd rather die than you would live out the rest of your days on this earth. Now they see Jesus coming. Maybe they've seen him before, I don't know, because Jesus traveled all around Judea, Galilee, Samaria. But now Jesus is coming in. He's within hollering distance. He's within the, the realm of we can get this guy's attention. After three and a half years, it's our turn. They ring their bell. The Bible says they start shouting out in a loud voice. You know they began to shout. They had to shout, leprous, 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 unclean, unclean, unclean. Think about the first words that they had to use. They had to use the words of separation. That's what society told them. That's what society taught them. Scared to death, they're hollering out, leprous, leprous, unclean, unclean. And then they start hollering out, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Can you help me? Can you save me? Can you heal me? Jesus tells the ten. It's interesting and it's fun when you begin to watch Jesus as he interacts with people throughout the New Testament. Sometimes he touches people. Sometimes he spits in people's eye. You know, one time he spit right in somebody's mouth and they were healed. Whatever works. That's it. You know what? We have our greeters that are coming in. They see you on the way in and shake your hand. You know what? I might, I think I'm thinking about creating a very special list of people with spit right in your mouth on the way out if we don't like the way that you react to this I don't know Ooh. hey all in the name of Jesus we hope you be healed <laughs> who said the Bible's not hilarious it's, it's a fun time now Jesus doesn't do any of those things he doesn't touch he doesn't make mud he doesn't even speak He doesn't even speak to the disease at this time. He says, turn and go to the priest to get yourself checked out. Here's the story. Back in those days, the priest was not only the priest of the town. We've learned this this year. They were also the bankers. The priest was the banker and the medic, apparently. Because you, if you had leprosy, you had to go to the priest and get get your sores checked out to see if, in fact, the leprosy was uh, in remission, which it, it wasn't. If it was, it was a miracle. But if all you had was a skin rash or something of that nature, then the priest would, he would baptize you, throw some oil on you, and then tell everybody in town, they're clean, they're fine. Most of the time, the priest would say, no, this is leprosy, you got to get back outside town. But in order to kind of roam about the cabin, in order to go about town and go to the marketplace and live your life, you had to go to the priest and get checked out. You had to be cleared. They're on their way to the priest. And on their way to the priest, Jesus heals them. When they get to the priest, the priest looks them over. Probably says something like, holy cow macaroni, I've never seen anything like this in my life. You're clean. You're free to go. Nine of them go straight to McDonald's and order Happy Meals. The one dude runs outside of the village. The Bible says he comes racing up to Jesus and in a loud voice like before. You remember when he was desperate? He was hollering, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. The other three, they're slopping on hamburgers and hot dogs. This guy runs to Jesus now in that same voice because he's grateful. And he's saying, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. The Bible says he threw himself at Jesus' feet and laid in the dirt face down. Takes his hand, wraps his hand around Jesus' feet.
because Jesus had saved him from his death sentence. And he was grateful. He was more than thankful. You see, if I say, Pastor Jen, thanks for bringing us to Rise Conference. It's a great deal, blah, blah, blah. Peace, yo. That's being thankful. But if I say, Pastor Jen, great job, did a great job. Tomorrow I'm taking you out and buying you lunch anywhere in town. That's gr- now, that's not going to happen. I'm just saying that would be grateful. I would be grateful at that point. We established I owe her lunch already. <laughs> Do you understand the difference in being thankful and grateful? Gratitude changes everything. You see, the other nine, they were healed. G- G- this is where Jesus and I, have, we have a conflict of theology. He's going to heal you. And you can go about your business. If I was in charge, I wouldn't heal you. <laughs> because I think that's what? Why would what? No. Bunch of ungrateful wild coyote. What? But then go back to the Bible and what does Jesus teach us? If somebody does spit in your face, if somebody does smack you on the cheek. You forgive them 70 times 7. He practiced what he preached. He's going to love you. The Bible says nothing can separate you from the love of God. He's going to save you. If you confess with your mouth, believe in your heart that Jesus is the Lord, the Bible says you will be saved. He will heal you. We've seen it here. And you can go about your business. I don't get it and I don't understand it. I do know that we will reap consequences and there's a whole bunch of stuff going on there but these other jokers they're gone this one guy comes back to Jesus and because gratitude changes everything the Bible makes note that this one man and by the way you understand this story is not in the Bible because it's so unusual and we don't understand it it's in the Bible is because we perfectly understand that one out of ten people actually know how to Be grateful. It's actually at the bottom of our being to be grateful. One out of ten. It's normal. It's natural. You understand negative news. You only have to do one negative thing. And and I forget what the statistic is. 20 or 30 people share it every minute until the whole world knows. Within minutes. If you do something positive... You have to do something positive like eight or nine times before one person actually tells one other person. You got one guy that recognized this man named Jesus. He freed me from a death sentence. And he came back to Jesus with a grateful heart. He skipped at lunch in everything. He loved Jesus. And then now watch. Jesus and this man dialogue. They like, they, they have conversation back and forth between each other. There's a personal relationship developing. Jesus now and this man, they're exchanging names, addresses, phone numbers, emails, the whole shoot match. This man says to Jesus, next time you come through town, I want to see it. Jesus says, next time I come through town, I'm not coming back through town. I'm going to give my life right now. And then Jesus says, when I go back up into heaven, I'm sending the Holy Spirit to you, pal. And the Holy Spirit will lead you, guide you, and protect you. And when you don't know what else to do, you can call on the great name of God, your Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit that I'm sending you. The Bible doesn't say that all that is right there in Scripture. But this man, while he's dialoguing with Jesus, don't you know that there was personal relationship developing and this man had insight and power that the other nine did not have because they didn't want it. Thank you, Heather, for coming to the second service. We chastised your name for skipping the first service. 
She's covering her face. This is too much fun. The Hawaii island name Molokia. How do you say it? Molokai. That's what somebody else told me too. I didn't believe him. I needed to ask you. Molokai. Heather, we made note in the first service that you moved here from Hawaii to Denellen. We don't know why, but we're not going to tell you any different. What in the world you're thinking? But anyway, we are glad you're here, and I hope you like it here to some degree. I love Denellen, and it's a fantastic. Molokai? The fifth largest Hawaiian island. Matter of fact, this island in Hawaii has the highest sea cliffs in the world, 3,315 feet above sea level, looking right down at the crashing waves. 3,315 feet. People come from all over the world and they stand on those cliffs and they appreciate God's beauty. Well, late in the 1700s, people from all over the world become, they started coming to these Hawaiian islands. Then they would go to Molokai. When they got to Molokai, they were bringing diseases from all over the world in the late 1700s. 1866, the Hawaiian government at the time created a leprosy colony. Pretty much identical to the Old Testament and even the New Testament leprosy colonies. They would go into family households, pull out people with leprosy, take them across the island. The island's 38 miles long, 10 miles apart. There was this part of the island that was blocked off for you if you had leprosy. The government would send people to your home, pull you, drag you, kicking and screaming and yelling out from your family, out of town and to the leprous colony. And at that moment in your life, whatever the date was, the Hawaiian government pronounced you legally dead. But you were alive, just incarcerated. You were alive, you were behind bars. Your only situation in life is you came down with a disease that you had no control over, yet it separated you from everything and everybody. That leprosy colony did not close until 1969. Leprosy today, as we're talking through this, represents anything and everything in your life that should not and cannot and will not be there anymore. Because let me inquire, let, let me challenge you. If you reach out to Jesus and say, save me. Then turn around and show him some gratitude. Show him some give a care. You can't keep living your life like you want to live it. It's not your life. It was never your life in the, in the very beginning. I told people before the service, I've been telling people this for about two or three weeks. I've been telling people, Jesus tricked me. Because if I would have known that every single week of my life was going to be so much reading and research and then a test at the end of the week. <laughs> Peace out. Not me, not for me. Not only would I have not been interested, I would have thought I couldn't do it. I would have thought that's above what I can even imagine doing. I can't do that. I've told you a hundred times, I won't go into it. I had, a very, I had a very significant reading problem in high school. I didn't really learn to read until I began to go to college. I would have thought there's no way that's going to happen. But Jesus said, comprehension or not, eye problems or not, Double vision, not dyslexia, not leprosy or not. I'm calling you from the dark, pal. I'm setting your feet up on a rock. I got my hand over you, but there's going to be a point in time I'm going to put my hand underneath of you, and I'm going to do this right here. And people are going to see my glory. My glory. That's you. 
That's you. God, I don't know if today God has, has his hand over you to protect you. Not to keep you down, to protect you. But at some point, and maybe it's today, or maybe it's tomorrow, or next year, at some point he's going to take that hand and shift it from above you. He's going to put it up below you. And he's going to lift you up. If you put and build your house up on the rock, and he's going to say, this is my glory, and her name is, and his name is your name, if you allow it. If you recognize that you're desperate, if I recognize that I'm desperate, I pastor this thing and I'm desperate for Jesus. If I'm desperate for Jesus, my only guess is that you're desperate for Jesus. I spent, well, I'm a man, so I spent a minute and 30 seconds picking out my clothes today. It's a pretty nice shirt, though, I think. It doesn't matter what I'm wearing. I'm still the same sloppy mess on the inside of my being here and here that you are. But God. He sends Jesus to a village, and he's not going to walk around you or whatever leprous situation you got attached to you or gripping your life. He's going to walk right up to you and face that death and look at that death right in the eye. He's going to touch you, heal you, speak to that disease, have it go, and then speak to you and say, my child. Jesus is going to say, my brother. God is going to say, my child, you've been adopted. The Holy Spirit's going to get on you, and you will be prophesying. You will be healing. You will feel power from on high. You will be his witness in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. That will be you. Full of power. Starts with gratitude. Recognizing God as our spiritual authority. Recognizing the fact that he has touched me. He has healed me. He has given me. Some days I come home and Krista says, how was your day? And I say, this day is terrible. Blah, 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 And then I go on and 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 more on and on. And then I look down at what I'm standing on. Wood floors that I didn't buy. I look at my countertops, countertops that I didn't buy. I look at my house, Robert Slack's here. A house I didn't paint and I didn't pay for. I look at the gifts God has given me. And I got to say, yeah, this planet is hell on earth. But thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And my wife hangs a sign in our living room and it says, there's always, 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 always something to be thankful for. Because there is. Life is difficult. It's... It's hell on wheels, and it's on fire, and it's a train wreck in the middle of the desert. It's all of those things. But there is a God, and he wants to put a river of living water in you in a well that never runs dry, and it just comes out of you full of power, goodness, grace, forgiveness. In this Bible story in Luke chapter 17, right before this story, there's, there's Jesus talking to his disciples and he's trying to teach them to have faith. And he looks at them and he says, if you have faith just as small as a mustard seed, you can look at this mulberry tree and have it cast into the sea. Remember we talked about Jesus spoke to mountains. and You can speak to mountains. You have power to speak to mountains and have that mountain move. Not like a literal mountain, but that can happen too because he is God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. Jesus, at this particular point, he says, you can speak to that mulberry tree if you have faith as small as a mustard seed. Don't, you don't have to research how small or how big is a mustard seed. If you got any faith at all, that's what Jesus is saying. If you got any faith at all, you can speak to this leprosy in your life and it be gone in the name of Jesus. You can thank Jesus for that mulberry tree. You can thank Jesus. Oh, now, this is crazy talk. The Apostle Paul talks like this. You can say, first of all, Jesus, thank you that I got leprosy. Man, that's a wild statement. Because I'm thankful, Lord, that you're going to teach me how to whoop its butt in the name of Jesus and it be gone and you be glorified and I be set free. And I'm thankful for that. Yeah. 
It's been a couple few weeks ago. I was walking through the house. I saw Krista. She's looking kind of pretty. I walked up to her and I said, babe, I love you. And I said, you are okay. I don't, that was not the anointing. I don't know where it came from. Instead of giving me a hug and a big old sloppy wet kiss, she took a step back. And she said, I'll remember that. <laughs> what? I, see, I'm not used to that in my life. And this verbiage that was just coming out of her being at that moment. I got on my cell phone and I forbid her to hang out with Jen Ryan and Tracy Baldeo anymore. That was it. That was the end of that. I walked around the house thinking, it was about, it was about two hours. I'm thinking, I, what can I do? What can I say? Nothing was coming to mind. Krista! After a while, she come walking up to me with a note in her hand. She said, somebody just sent me a love note in the mail. She opened it up, and my name was on it. I had sent it three or four days prior, and it showed up in the mail that day. I said, thank you, Jesus. you got to recognize when, God, when he's got your back. When he's got your back and your future, that's how. I, I don't get really how, but he's got it all covered. Because he loves you. He wants a relationship with you. So much so that he's going to heal you and save you. Without a long list of to-do's. But the way I see it in my brain is that I owe Jesus. It is a fact that I did not ask Jesus to die on a cross for me, but it is a fact that he did put me on this planet and he gave me a life to live and a life to be lived abundantly. And I recognize the, all of those things. And when I finally think in my brain, I'm going to give Jesus a try. Jesus, would you save me? Would you heal me? And when he does that, the way that my brain clicks, maybe yours don't, but the way that my brain works is that now I, I, I owe Jesus. Like I owe Jesus. Jesus is not saying you owe me. I'm saying that I owe Jesus gratitude. I owe that to him. That's what I owe to him. I, I just want you to feel the same. This story in the Bible is... Jesus wanting you to feel the same because he wants a personal relationship with you. The Bible says, Solomon says, there's a time and a place for everything. So let's show Jesus some gratitude. Then we can eat lunch. Then we can this. Then we can that. Then you can handle the stress and anxiety of this world. But let's show some gratitude. Gratitude is, is giving. Oh, well, that's what this whole thing is about, this Thanksgiving season. It's about giving. Let's start with Jesus and showing him some gratitude. This man that came back to Jesus grabbed him by the ankles. He was giving up his time, anything he had. All he probably had was a bowl for some people to throw soup or money or meat into. All he had was the cloak on, on his back. But what he had, he brought it to Jesus. Like the woman with the little tiny red scent. That's all she had. She brought it to Jesus. And it moved him. It's okay. To move Jesus today. To pop his eyes wide open and say, wow, look at this one. This is not the norm. And draw this one to me. I love it when my kids hang out beside me or talk to me or give me any sort of an attention at all. I love that. It's the same, it's the same with Jesus. It's the same with God. God and Jesus love it when we go to them and say, I just want to hang out with you today. How's that? Great, pal. Great. Will you please stand with me today? Will my prayer team please come and stand right here in the, uh, in the middle of, uh, right below me here, below the steps.
today, this week, would you please, please, please think of a way that you can show gratitude to Jesus. This is between you and Jesus, not me and you. How can you really thank him? How can you really show some love, respect, and appreciation? How can you do that? Please don't walk out of here not thinking that. How, how that through this Thanksgiving week, how can you give thanks to the Lord God Almighty? Wow, wow, wow. We sing all these songs and they move me. Some days it's not about Jesus healing me. It's not about Jesus doing for me. It's not about the, it's about me saying, thank you, Jesus. Now here's what I've got, little as it is. I want you to have it. Today, if you want Jesus to be the Lord of your life, the Savior of your soul, to heal your body, whatever it may be, would you please repeat this prayer after me? Dear Jesus, I love you. Save my soul. Heal my body. Protect me. Lead me. Guide me. I thank you for dying on a cross for me. Thank you for loving me. In Jesus' name. Amen. Friend, today, come and get some prayer from one of our friends that pray, they pray a prayer blessing over you. You don't even know it, I'm telling you. I'm desperate and you're desperate. You're desperate today. You're desperate today. The Bible says anybody who's got any kind of wealth to them at all, it's going to be more difficult for them to get into heaven than it is the camel to pass through the eye of a needle. These are the types of scriptures we need to have jump up off the page and, and make be very clear to us in our mind. What does that mean? That means don't allow the things of this world to sidetrack you to where you don't recognize how desperate you are. True, you're not ripped from your family. You get to go to Thanksgiving dinner this week. You're not on the outside of town living in a leprous colony. But maybe spiritually you are. That's a question. That's a question for you. Don't be, don't be tricked by the enemy, the devil, just because he bought you a new car and you have a nice home. I said that. because Jesus wants you to have nice things, but sometimes, whether I'm serving Jesus or not, I can go out and make some money and buy myself a hamburger. I could even buy myself a motorcycle if I wanted. But without Jesus, I don't have a personal relationship. Without Jesus, I don't have power from on high. Without Jesus, I don't have joy unspeakable. I don't have all these things that matter. I don't have all these things that make people commit suicide. See, time and money, the, uh, what, how many professional athletes, how many lottery winners commit suicide? Because it's not about having time or money. It's about having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. It's about having spiritual authority in your life to speak to the mountains and say, get out of my life. It's about me coming home and recognizing, yeah, it wasn't the best day ever, but guess what? I'm coming home. I'm coming home and my family's going to be there. And God has provided that home in your life. Just take a look at what God has provided and say, thank you, Jesus. And then figure out how to show gratitude in the name of Jesus. Today, today, thank you very much for coming today. Thank you very much for coming today. Now, let's finish what God has started in our life and allow Him to put an exclamation point on what really matters in your life today. 